Ready. All right, good afternoon and welcome back to Codex. So many, but not all of our talks this summer feature graduate students and postdocs who were nominated to speak by their senior colleagues. Uh, today, we're very happy to have Joseph Cummings be the first speaker in this series. Joe is currently a graduate student at the University of Kentucky, graduating in May of 2022. His research, advised by Professor Christopher Mannon, focuses on T varieties and algebraic structures. We're excited to have him here to tell us about phylogenetic networks, and in particular, an application of harmonic, harmonic analysis to their study. Take it away. Okay, thank you uh, very much for having me. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about phylogenetic networks. And um, I should say, so my name is Joe Cummings, um, and this work is joint with my advisor, Chris Mannon, and um, also a graduate student um, at NC State, Ben Hollering. Um, okay, let's get started. Whoa, okay, there we go, now it's working. Okay, so um, today uh, we're gonna be talking about some background in phylogenetics. So we're gonna be talking about, you know, the, the basic models that we'll be working with, but well, first we'll talk about them for uh, phylogenetic trees. Then we'll talk about the CFN model on um, phylogenetic trees. And then at the end, we will apply the CFN model to uh, more complicated structures called networks. So here's the basic problem in um, phylogenetics is we, let's say we have a uh, collection of species and let's say that, you know, you have a human, a chimp and a gorilla. And what you'd like to know is you'd like to find the tree that best explains their evolutionary history. So you can see um, like on the tree on the left, you have human and chimps are uh, more closely related than they are to gorillas. Whereas the tree on the right, you have chimps and gorillas more closely related than the, to each other than they are to humans. Now, like back in the day, if you were like Charles Darwin or you know an evolutionary biologist, you might like measure femur bones or something of that nature. Um, but at the end of the day, whenever you do something like that, um, you have to make some sort of subjective choice. But now, um, in today's world, we have DNA sequencing. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to uh, compare these different species, um, like genetic codes. And then from that information, we'd like to make a more objective decision about which tree is correct. So um, how is this set up? So we have DNA bases, A, C, G, and T. Um, and we have that uh, species, we are saying that related species have a common ancestor. And what we're gonna do with these DNA sequences is we're gonna come up with an alignment. So we have these long strings of DNA bases and um, they are aligned in such a way so that, you know, the like the first column is all G's, but those all genes correspond to each other in that, um, in that spot in each species. So we're gonna go up to a lot of species, a lot of uh, humans, a lot of chimps, a lot of gorillas. We're gonna you know, sequence their DNAs and then we're gonna come up with this alignment. And that's where we're starting. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on one particular column in the alignment. And we're also going to assume that the columns evolve independently. We're going to fix a column. Um, and then with all this data that we're collecting, we're going to compute a, like a, a joint probability distribution. So this is something, you know, we, we've collected all this data and now we say, okay, what's the probability that in this particular column in the alignment that the human has a C and the chimp has a T and the gorilla has an A. So we've, we've collected all that data. And our goal is to develop a tree detector. So for example, on the tree on the left, how do we tell if that's actually the correct tree or not? Um, and so that, that's our first goal is for trees, we wanna come up with an object which tells us if we have the correct tree. Okay, so how do these models work? Um, so these are hidden variable Markov models. So we have this tree on the left. Um, at the leaves, we have our observable variables. So these are like human, chimps, and gorillas. And um, these random variables are taking values in A, C, G, and T. Uh, then we have hidden variables, which are also taking values in the same spot. 
we're going to fix a root distribution. So in this example here on the left, that is the probability that you know y1 is equal to a, the probability that y1 is equal to c, so on and so forth. And uh, we also have uh, transition matrices for each edge in uh, in the graph. And what these transition matrices or, and what these transition matrices record is, for example, if you look in column C and row A, this is the probability that Y2 is equal to C given that the probability, that given that uh, Y1 is equal to A. And then we have that sort of everywhere. So these are just sort of recording like everything. They're recording all the, uh, all the conditional probabilities. And then um, we could ask, well, um, what's the probability of, you know, we have these transition matrices and a root distribution. Well, we can actually say what the probability of observing little x1, x2, and x3 is in terms of the root distribution and the transition matrices. So what you do is you sum over all possible states of uh, the random variables y1 and y2. And then you take, so pi of y1 is the probability that big y1 is equal to little y1. And then you multiply by all these uh, conditional probabilities, and that will end up giving you uh, our joint probability that big X1 is equal to little X1, big X2 is equal to little X2, and big X3 is equal to little X3. And the important thing to notice here is that um, this probability is uh, given in terms of, you know, it's a polynomial in terms of the entries in the transition matrices and the root distribution. And what this is gonna allow us to do is it's gonna allow us to use tools from algebra and algebraic geometry to help build our tree detector. So the important thing to take away from the slide is that it's a polynomial. Um, and we can do the same thing in general. So instead of that small tree, we can take a big tree with N leaves. We're still going to have a hidden variable Markov model. We're, now we have a, just any binary rooted tree uh, with leaves x, you know, one through n. Uh, for each vertex, we're going to have a random variable, and um, it's taking values in one through kappa. So in the previous example, you could say that kappa was four because it could take on four different things. And then for each edge, we have a kappa by kappa transition matrix where um, it gives the conditional probability that um, you know, the child is equal to j given that the parent was equal to i. And then we're also going to fix a root distribution. And then um, given this, the joint probability distribution is very similar, uh, similar to the previous slide. You sum over all possible states of the interior vertices. And then you take the root distribution and you, then you multiply by all these conditional probabilities. And then you get the probability of observing x1 through xn at the leaves. And again, the takeaway here is that p of x1 through xn is a polynomial in the entries of pi, in, in the entries of the root distribution and the transition matrices. So now um, we're going to use some tools from algebraic geometry. So first of all, we need to know what a variety is. Um, we can think of a variety as, so if we fix some polynomials, F1 through FK with complex coefficients and M variables, then uh, we can form a variety, which is just the solution set to that system of polynomials. We also have a vanishing ideal. So given a variety, or actually it doesn't have to be a variety, it could be any subset of C to the M. Um, we're going to look at all polynomials that vanish on every point in that set. And that's going to give us an idea. Now, um, we have a polynomial parameterization of the, of our probability distributions from before. So this is like the P of X1 through XN is equal to the sum over all interior states, blah, 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 blah. So here, the delta k n minus one is uh, a, just a simplex. So it's the convex hull of all the standard basis vectors where you have kappa to the n many basis vectors. So on the right here, this is our prop. These are our joint probabilities. And then um, theta t, this is the stochastic parameter space. And that is just the, that's like the set of all 
um, possible fillings of our transition matrices and root distributions. And then what we'd like to know is we'd like to know, okay, if I fix a tree T, are there like, are there fillings of the transition matrices and root distribution so that I get my observed joint probability distribution? So I'm wondering if I've observed a joint probability distribution along the leaves. And I'd like to know if I lie in the image of Psi. And if I am, then that means that this tree T is a good candidate for, uh, to descri for describing the evolutionary history of these species. Um, and so in order to tell if you lie in this image, we have a tree detector. And um, what it is, is it's the vanishing ideal of the image of uh, this polynomial map. So it is, a, it is, a, it is an ideal. Um, we have variables um, P of X1 through Xn where Xi are living in Kappa. And uh, what this is, is sort of like, you know, it's um, this ideal is like the set of all algebraic relations that your joint probability distribution has to satisfy in order to, um, in order for it to be a good, in order for this tree to be a good candidate. So let's say that you, you, you know, you collect all this data, um, you have the joint probability distribution, and then you take the way that you tell if this is a good tree or not is you take a generating set for the ideal, which is finite because we're working over a polynomial ring or a field. And then you plug your joint probability distribution into uh, these polynomials. And if all of those vanish, then that means you lie in the image of Psi and we have a good tree candidate. So this, this is our tree detector. This is the thing that we're trying to find uh, for trees. And we'll also be doing for networks, but this is sort of like the main player for today. We wanna to find out what this ideal is because this is our tool for seeing if we have the right tree. Okay. So um, one thing that I should mention though, is we haven't really made any assumptions on the model. You know, so far it's pretty general. Um, and so for example, on that three leaf tree, um, I tried computing that ideal just in Macaulay two uh, yesterday. And I let it run for like six hours and it didn't give me anything. And that was a small tree. So um, we need to make some, we need to make some more assumptions on the model so that it's not ridiculous. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the CFN model uh, which what we're going to do is um, we're going to take, uh, we have our four DNA bases, we have A, G, C, and T. So it turns out that A and G and C and T, uh, they are closely related in terms of their chemical structure. So we're going to associate A and G with zero and C and T with one. We're going to think about those as living in Z mod two. We're going to assume that the root distribution is uniform. And then the important assumption is that our transition matrices are gonna take a certain form. So they're all gonna be, uh, you know, this form alpha, beta, beta, alpha. Um, and, you know, what this is saying is it's saying that, you know, the probability of the gene changing is beta and the probability of the gene not changing is alpha. And then um, for each edge, uh, we can define um, a function from Z mod two to R. Um, so FE of zero is gonna be alpha and FE of one is gonna be beta. And then if we look in the GH ent entry of ME, so our columns are indexed by zero and one, our rows and columns are, then um, the GH entry is just equal to FE of G, G minus H. And um, before we write down the probability distribution, I just wanna say that we have made um, significant um, you know, uh, assumptions on the model and it does have the effect of unrooting the tree. So before we had the tree on the left, you know, we had like a four leaf thing. Um, but now after we put these assumptions on the model, we don't actually know where the root is anymore. So now we're looking at these, um, 
these uh, trees where all the interior nodes have degree three, but we still have four leaves, but we don't know where the, the root is. Okay, and then um, we can rewrite the uh, probability of observing G1 through Gn, where the Gi's are living in Z mod two. And um, the root distributions, okay, those all turn into one half because we're assuming pi is uniform. And then we have this, uh, you know, we have this F of UV HU minus HV, this product of all these things. And what this should look like is it should look like a convolution. Um, and so what we're gonna do with this is we're gonna apply a discrete Fourier transform. And it's gonna take this really kind of awful polynomial you know, that has um, lots of terms, it's pretty high degree, um, and it's going to turn it into um, a monomial map. So we have a convolution, we're gonna apply a discrete Fourier transform. Um, our Fourier coordinates are uh, Q, G1 through Gn, and these are the P hats of the G1 through Gn. Uh, the image coordinates, so instead of the FEs, um, after applying the discrete Fourier transform, uh, we're gonna call those parameters A upper E sub G, where E is an edge in the tree and G is in Z mod two. Um, we apply the discrete Fourier transform, this turns, it, this turns our sort of complicated thing into a monomial map, which means two things. It means that um, our tree detector, well, so it, it's prime, we already actually knew that. But we also know that it's generated by binomials. Um, and in fact, uh, this ideal is the ideal of a, of a toric variety. So what that means is that we can import a lot of tools um, from toric geometry to studying these things. Now, um, I want to describe to you what this ideal looks like. And one thing that we need for that is um, this parameterization actually factors upon um, splitting the tree along an edge. So for example, if we have this four leaf tree on the left, then um, the parameterization factors, if you, split it up, if you split it up into two trees. And so what that sort of means is, is that if we know the ideal for the left tree and the ideal for the right tree, we can combine those in a certain way um, to get the ideal on the left. Um, this process is known as the toric fiber products. And I apologize for people mowing um, they're very loud, which is frustrating. Okay, so, um, right, so here's the ideal. Uh, what we do is we take a split in the tree. So what this is, is um, you take the tree and you remove an edge. This um, partitions the leaf set. So we have the leaves are labeled by one, two, three, and four. And um, deleting this edge, uh, Partitions are leaf set into one, two, and three, four based on which connected components they're lying in. And I'm gonna move downstairs. I think it'll be quieter. I'm sorry. Hopefully it's quieter. I visited my parents over Memorial Day and um, it's loud here. Okay, so um, for our tree, we pick an edge. Removing this edge from the tree gives us two connected components of the tree, and then that gives us a, a partition of the leaf set. And then our parameterization um, can be given in terms of all possible splits. So if you take Q, G1 through Gn, you take the product over all splits, A, E, B, E, and then uh, it's this product of the A upper E, and then you sum all the GIs that live in one side of the split. But this only makes sense if the sum of the GIs is zero, because otherwise, um, you know, which side of the split do you choose? And then um, if the sum of the GIs is not zero, then, um, then the Q G1 through GN is just zero. So this is what happens, this is what you get after applying the discrete Fourier transform. Okay, so now we wanna just, we wanna, we know what the parameterization is. We sort of have a combinatorial interpretation of it in terms of splits. 
And now what we'd like to do is we'd like to describe the generators of this idea. So um, for a non-trivial split, so this just means that um, you remove an edge and each uh, set in the partition has size at least two. Um, we're gonna get two matrices. And then um, the ideal is just generated by all the two by two miners of these matrices. So how do we make these matrices? Well, let's take this tree. And uh, the first one we're gonna call ME. So the, um, the split is one, two, three, four. And um, what we did here is I labeled the rows and columns by um, all length two, zero, one sequences whose sum is even, hence the E. And then um, we did Q zero, zero, we have Q sub four zeros. And what that is, is I'm putting zero, zero in the one, two spot and zero, zero in the three, four spot and concatenating those um, because the split is one, two, three, four. And then we're doing that sort of in all the places. And then we also have an odd matrix where we do the same exact thing, um, but now we have zero, one sequences that sum to an odd thing. And then we combine them accordingly. And um, in this case, there's only one non-trivial split. There's only that edge in the middle. And so we take the two by two minors of these guys, which is just their determinants. And uh, that gives us our tree detector. So we have this ideal generated by two binomials. Um, and so this actually works for, all, for any tree, um, which is pretty neat with the CFN model. Um, and uh, I should also say that these methods are actually fairly competitive um, because this um, being generated by these two by two miners, that can be checked you know, checking to see whether your probability distribution like zeros out on these polynomials is the same as making all these matrices and seeing that they're rank one. Um, and uh, so that can be checked uh, really efficiently. And um, so like what we've done is, is we've, we started with something complicated. We um, made the problem a little bit easier by uh, looking at the CFN model and we've, now can find uh, these tree detectors. We can find polynomials that will tell us whether uh, we have the correct tree or not. And um, now uh, we sort of want to move on to networks. Um, and the reason is, is because, you know, not all of our evolutionary behaviors are actually tree-like. So for example, we can have horizontal gene transfer, which is the transfer of genetic material um, via a method other than parent to offspring. So uh, this is very common in uh, you know, smaller organisms like uh, bacteria and viruses. Um, you know, this process can uh, help create you know, antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, and it's actually, well, it's a little controversial, but uh, it can happen in larger organisms as well. And I found these two, um, these two papers which contradict each other, which I think is fun. But the first one says that, you know, um, horizontal gene transfer is a, you know, a hallmark of, uh, you know, both vertebrate and in invertebrate genome. And then uh, that was in 2015. And then in 2017, uh, you know, somebody wrote something that says it's, it's not a hallmark. So who knows? But um, either way, we're not gonna be looking at trees anymore. Instead, we're gonna be looking at networks, which are gonna look something like this. Um, and then we also have this fun picture. So if you took a beaver playing a flying V and uh, a duck playing the keyboard, then you might get a platypus who plays the guitar. Um, anyway, okay, so uh, we wanna focus on uh, level one networks. So what, precisely are these networks that we're looking at. Um, so now we're gonna be allowing cycles. Um, they're not gonna be trees anymore. Um, the solid edges, those are gonna be called tree edges. And uh, the dotted edges, those are called reticulation edges. And these are where sort of where species are combining into one. 
the, ret the reticulation vertices are where the reticulation edges are meeting. And then the main assumption that we're going to make, so, so far what we've described is a network, um, but the main assumption we're going to make is that each biconnected component of our graph is only going to have one reticulation vertex. And the way that you should think about that is we're just taking cycles and then we're gluing them together along trees. So for example, you couldn't have a cycle with two reticulation vertices. Um, and I don't think this is a large assumption to make, but it does make the math doable. So um, there's that. Um, and, uh, but there are more complicated networks um, that you know people study. Um, and I think uh, there's a paper by uh, Colby Long and Elizabeth Gross uh, where they talk about this. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. Okay. So how is the network parameterization gonna work? We wanna sort of leverage the tree parameterization to make the parameterization for the network. So we fix a network N. Say we have a bunch of reticulation vertices, but they're all li living on different cycles. Um, and then for each reticulation vertex, we have some reticulation edges. And then if we fix a length M01 vector, that's gonna give us a tree. T sigma, where uh, if the ith component of sigma is zero, that means we delete EI zero. And if sigma i is equal to one, then we delete EI one. And so sort of going through all possible zero one vectors, this gives us all the underlying trees. Um, and then the network parameterization is given as follows. And as you can see, it's pretty long. So um, before we had a monomial parameterization, um, so even if we do the CFN model on each tree, and then we say that, hey, that's gonna be the network thing, we have a parameterization that's, it's not monomial anymore. It has two to the M um, many pieces. And that's, that's not good. We, we like monomials more. So we'd like to simplify this a little bit. And we will, but uh, our network detector is just, again, it's the vanishing ideal of the image of this map. And um, like I said, this still has a lot of terms. It's not a monomial parameterization anymore, but uh, we'd like to make it simpler by sort of reducing the number of articulation vertices that we ever have to consider. So it turns out that um, for level one networks, uh, you only ever have to consider the case where there is one reticulation vertex. So um, if you take a network, and um, let's say you take the network on the right. You can take that by gluing together the two networks on the left. And it turns out that uh, kind of via the same process that we can break trees apart, um, we can also break networks apart like this, as long as they're connected by an edge. And um, if we know the ideals for the two, um, networks on the left, then we also know the ideal for the network on the right, the larger network. And so this reduces the problem to, uh, for level one networks at least, for uh, finding the vanishing ideals for these N sunlets, these cycle networks. So we're gonna be considering sunlets. Um, an N sunlet is just a cycle um, with a leaf glued to each vertex. Um, and then there's gonna be a single reticulation vertex. Uh, we're gonna denote it as SN. And, um, you know, this network is, there's only two underlying trees. Uh, so in this picture, if we delete either E5 or E8, that gives us two different trees. And uh, if we think back to, um, the parameterization that we have for networks, that means that, okay, so it's not a monomial map, it's a binomial map, and that's not great. You know, monomial maps are better, but um, it's not awful. Um, let's look at an example um, for the, this small network. So we have this sunlet. Um, so if you, write down the parameterization um, and you can, uh, you know, there's like a 
map of rings, a map of polynomial rings, and uh, you compute the kernel of this, and that will give you I of S4. Um, it turns out to be generated by one degree two polynomial. Um, and some of these terms should look familiar. So for example, if you delete E5, and um, you just turn this single polynomial into two, this is the um, tree ideal from uh, before with four leaves on it. And um, if you delete the other edge, um, you get something a little bit different. Uh, the terms are sort of swapped around, um, but that's just because there's like a permutation of the leaves happening. But even then, if you take say the, um, in, the in the main polynomial up top, if you take the first and last term, that will give you the um, second polynomial in, uh, in IS4 minus E8. And then if you take the two middle guys, that gives you the, the first term in there too. So um, one way to describe this ideal I of S4 is it is generated by the um, all quadratics that live in the degree two part of the intersection of the two tree ideals. Um, it turns out that we think that this is sort of always the case. Um, so um, we think that the vanishing ideal of uh, the sunlight network is generated by quadratics. And we also think that it's of dimension 2n. Um, and then as for the quadratics, we have the following theorem, um, which says, so if we're gonna let T1 and T2 be the two trees obtained by deleting the reticulation edges. Um, and then we know that uh, a quadratic lies in this ideal of the sunlight network, if and only if it lies in the intersection of T1 and T2, not the intersection of T1 and T1, because that is just T1. But uh, that should say T1 and T2. Um, and then, you know, okay, so that's sort of an okay description, but we actually do have um, an explicit description of these um, generators. And um, if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk about them. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily worth it at the moment. Um, and then uh, we also have the following proposition that um, follows from that theorem. Um, so if we're gonna let T be the tree obtained by deleting all the edges adjacent to the reticulation vertex. So um, for example, in, oh no, um, in this picture, um, if you deleted E1, E5, and E8, that would give you T. Um, then that ideal is strictly contained in the sunlight network, which is also strictly contained in the intersection of T1 and T2. Um, and then from that, we can conclude some uh, things about the dimension of uh, the ideal of SM. We know it's between 2N minus 1 and 2N plus 1 inclusive, and we think it's 2N. Um, right, so some evidence for the conjecture above. Um, we know that um, up to n equals eight, we've been able to verify that um, I of Sn is generated by quadratics. Um, we were able to do that by, um, well, we, we have an explicit description for the degree to, for the quadratic generators. So we wrote that down. We were able to verify that those ideals were prime. And we're also able to verify that they're dimension 2n. And then um, we knew that the dimension of the uh, network ideal was 2n in those cases um, by looking at the rank of the Jacobian of the parameterization. And then we also know that the dimension of this ideal is actually 2n for all n less than or equal to 30. Um, that computation is just easier to do than computing like a full Grubner basis. So we we're able to check that. And so, you know, in the future, um, we plan to show that, you know, the degree two piece of this ideal is prime and it's of the right dimension, um, which would prove the conjecture. That's, that's the hope. Um, one way we might be able to do this is um, we might be able to look at torque degenerations of these, uh, of these network varieties. Um, and so what we're trying to say is, is that you know, these, these varieties, they're not torque varieties because they're not parameterized by monomials. 
um, but they're sort of close in some sense. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to find these nice toric varieties, which are very close to the um, network variety and then be able to conclude things about, you know, prime primality and um, dimensionality. Um, it would also be interesting to look at other group-based models um, for uh, networks. So there's the jukes canner model, there's the Kimura 2 uh, parameter model, and there's the Kimura 3 parameter model. Those are also group-based models, but instead of taking values in Z mod 2, they take values in Z mod 4. Those are also very well understood for trees. Um, and so it'd be interesting to uh, try to do some of this same, these same uh, techniques on, um, for, for these models on networks. Um, and then another possible avenue that would be interesting to look at is uh, we'd like to look at the CFN model with a molecular clock. So the advantage of the molecular clock condition is that it doesn't unroot the tree. Um, and uh, so, and then um, it's just an extra condition that you can place on it. And um, it would be interesting to study that as well. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. I know I finished a little early, but um, if you'll have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. All right, thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm gonna hit that reaction button as I encourage you all to do. And uh, we can stop the recording.